Well, yes, good afternoon. Um, thank you, Gail, and welcome to you all. Um, thank you for joining us today for what promises to be a particularly insightful program, especially for braving the rain in our parking lot that I feel uh, here it was backed up, so sorry about that. Um, as Gail stated, my name is Katie Delmay, and I am the curator who organized the exhibition that's on view in our Conte Community Arts Gallery until October 14th, just a few more days. We shall overcome civil rights and the Nashville press uh, 1957 to 68. While we have long wanted to present a project devoted to this subject, we realized that the right moment to do so would be in 2018 as a way of marking the 50th anniversary of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s death here in Tennessee. The exhibition and the accompanying book that Gail plugged for us, thank you, um, that's published by Vanderbilt University. Um, it features, I'll just also note, an additional 50 photographs um, aside from what's in the exhibition. It also features a foreword by Congressman John Lewis and essays by Frist Art Museum director Susan Edwards and um, Fisk University professor Linda Wynn. Um, and I actually will just take a moment especially to, to thank Gail Williams. She is a beloved board member, and it was she and a, another um, member of our board who really spearheaded the fundraising campaign for this publication. So we're very grateful for her, her insight and her dedication to our institution. So thank you, Gail. So the exhibition and the book really do build upon a recent swelling of interest in this period throughout the city from witness walls, which you may know is a major public artwork at the historic courthouse that was commissioned by the Metro Arts Commission, to the large-scale painted mural in North Nashville by the North Art Collective, um, which both of those projects also pay homage to the local heroes of the movement during the late 1950s and 60s. For while fellow southern cities such as Birmingham, Greensboro, and Little Rock may have been the focus of more headlines, Nashville also played an important role in the civil rights movement. Our plan for integrating public schools, while far from perfect, was adopted by um, almost all the other cities throughout the southeast. And following a successful sit-in movement led by students, mostly from Fisk University, Tennessee A&I, which of course is now Tennessee State University, Meharry Medical College, and American Baptist College, we became the first metropolis in the South to integrate places of business. And perhaps most importantly, Nashville was a hub for training these students in nonviolent protest. And many of them, including John Lewis, of course, became influential figures on the national stage. In fact, during a speech at Fisk University in 1960, Dr. King himself stated, I came to Nashville not to bring inspiration, but to gain inspiration from the great movement that has taken place in this community. This important legacy is worthy of re-examination by those who lived through the turbulent era and introduction to younger audiences and the many newcomers to the region who may not be aware of this history. The exhibition is also occurring at a time where, unfortunately, race relations, social justice, and activism are again at the forefront of our, our country's collective consciousness. And this period reminds us that it is indeed our country's brave youth, often under the thoughtful guidance of elders, that can and will demand change. So We Shall Overcome presents 50 photographs taken by photojournalists working for the two daily papers at the time, the Tennessean, which is considered the more progressive publication, and, that, and the now defunct Nashville Banner. Um, Who's a more conservative paper whose leadership seemed less interested in covering these events related to racial issues. The banner, of course, um, closed in 1993, and its archive is housed at the Nashville Public Library. The photographs on view depict a narrative that has moments of triumph and joy, as well as pain and hate. And while much change has come, some of the images remind us that America is still struggling to achieve true racial equity here in Nashville and around the country. 
Today we will learn more about the roles that each of the schools involved in the student movement of the 60s played and what each administration's response was to various events. We are honored to have a very distinguished panel with us, Dr. Lucius Turner Outlaw, Jr., a professor of philosophy at Vanderbilt University, Dr. Loretha Williams, associate professor of African American and public history at Tennessee State University, and Linda T. Wynn, assistant director for state programs at the Tennessee Historical Commission and a professor of history at Fisk University. Their more complete bios are available in your programs. Our conversation will be moderated by the equally distinguished and very knowledgeable Andrea Blackman, division director and director of the Civil Rights Room at the Nashville Public Library. So without further ado, I will turn the stage over to Ms. Blackman and our panelists. Please join me in welcoming them to the stage. Good afternoon. You're so quiet. We're not at the library, you guys. Good afternoon. Again, thank you, Katie, and thank you, Gail. Um, again, I'm Andrea Blackman and these distinguished colleagues, and, and actually I can say friends. It's really good to see. I don't think the four of us have been in the same space in a long time, so thank you for this, this convening of us. I'll give you an idea of what today's format will look like. I'm going to take some time to ask each individual panelist a question. He and she will respond four or five minutes. We'll take some turns asking questions and then we want to hear from you. And You can ask them the tough questions. They all are esteemed historians and scholars and they love to be challenged. Let me say it again. They love to be challenged, so feel free to ask them any questions that you may have. The institutions represented on our panel today Dr. Outlaw was a student at Fisk University, but he will, look, he will speak to us from both the perspective of Vanderbilt University and also as a student at Fisk in the 60s. You have Linda T. Wen, who is a student at Tennessee State University, but also teaches at Fisk, and she has a unique insight on women and young, and also students from the female perspective of the movement. And we have Dr. Williams, who teaches at TSU, but also is a graduate of a non-HBCU, but has HBCU ties in history of North Nashville. So collectively, they bring years and years of experience to can help you understand and grapple with why Nashville students led this movement that we know as the modern civil rights movement better than any other major city that we would like to say in the South. So sit back, enjoy this conversation, and we hope that you will um, indulge us and join in the conversation with us in a little bit. You ready? They haven't seen all these questions. So, Lee, I want to start off with you. If you could specifically speak to how your institution, how TSU, gave these future activists. We know the leaders came from majority, um, Katie just mentioned them, TSU or Tennessee A&I, Fisk, Meharian American Baptist. If you could speak to us a little bit about how TSU gave these future activists, quote unquote, the opportunity to be affirmed, an opportunity to be themselves, and an opportunity to exist in this unapologetic, historically back black space on an HBCU campus. Speak to us, please, about that. Okay. <clears throat> First, I want to um, thank the Fris and Andrea and everybody involved for giving me an opportunity to speak. Um, I want to talk for a second, if I can, about the students that were at TSU during the 1960s and I'm trying to tread very lightly because I know these people, right? Um, many of them 
I love as friends and family here in Nashville. Um, but they arrive at TSU as young people, 18, 19, 20 some odd years old. And, and for those of us who can remember that period in our own lives, um, it was kind of the period where we wrestled with our parents. We, we struggled with what their generation had accomplished and we desperately tried to recreate the world as we thought it should be. So they're at TSU. Two grandmothers removed from slavery. So it's very likely that many of them may or may not have heard about a time in American history when they couldn't come to a place like TSU. They are being sent to TSU with this, this idea that they have a responsibility to the community. That is, you go there and you get your education and you come out a better person and you're able to make the world anew. So they arrived there in 1860 and it's, it's um, a critical time in the period because I think about what instructions their parents may have given them before they arrived on campus. And we're mindful that many of these folks that are from Chicago and Detroit and other major urban areas, they probably had relatives down there in the Deep South. Matter of fact, the presence in these cities was a result of much of the racism they confronted. So I'm sure they told these students, like our parents told us, go down there and get your education and don't get involved in anything that's going to bring shame to the family or get us in trouble. So they arrive in Nashville at one of the in most interesting times in its history. Um, there's a push that's percolating just below the surface for civil rights. And oftentimes think about, you know, what pushed these students to get involved in the movement. And, and be mindful of this. I, I, I studied African American history at Florida State, and I studied the Nashville movement, but it wasn't until I arrived at TSU that I could actually probe a bit to find out what may have motivated these students to get involved. One person I know informed me she was sitting in the cafeteria and somebody was passing out flyers about an event that was happening at a church where um, this young man who was teaching nonviolent protests. And I can imagine how alien that must have sounded to this person. I remember speaking to another student, another woman who was a student at that time, who talked about being at TSU because her brother couldn't get into a white school in Alabama. So her joining the movement was part of this protest. Also have spoken to students who were from rural Tennessee. These are country folks and their experience may have been very different from what we see occurring in Nashville or in other urban areas. But they're here at the same time with the single purpose of, of making the world anew. And TSU provided them a stage to participate in this. And that TSU had an intimate relationship with the North Nashville community. Um, it was a school that trained the teachers that taught the students in the community. It was a institution that allowed some of the families in the neighborhood to take in students who couldn't find um, um, housing on campus. So this interaction also got our students intimately involved in the day-to-day -day problems of, of, um, of the, their, their lives. So in, in short, 
when we look at TSU during the, the 1960s, during this period, um, bear in mind it, 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 it became a transformative space, a space where the students make the transition from um, being young folks to adults. And it equipped them with the skills that they needed to make the world anew. At TSU, they would have been told about the many great Fiskites who had received their education right down the street. At TSU, they would have encountered many, many great businessmen. They would have partied at the clubs, they would have visited the hotels, and they would realize that this, this, this space that they were in provided a refuge from, from, from the ills of, of segregation. But they would realize that they were better than that, that they deserved more. Thank you, and I should have said earlier, you can, you, both of you or any of us can jump in at any time, and this is us having a conversation with each other, but also with the audience as well. So, Linda, Lee said that TSU provided this, this space, it became this transformative space, and we want you to speak a little bit about that changing and that shift in attitude from a campus that is just a few feet away, and the idea and perceptions and these attitudes that existed, yes, TSU was a platform in this space of transformation, but what role did Fisk play? And was it the same transforming space? I think it was the same transformative space. One of the things that I did when I looked at the questions, I went back to look at the mottos of each school. I looked at the motto of Fisk University, sons and daughters forever on the altar. Tennessee State, enter to learn, go forth to serve. Uh, ABC, light a flame that, the, that, serve, that will serve the Lord forever. Uh, Meharry, worship God through service to mankind. Uh, so within those mottos, there, there is, they are pregnant with the idea of service, uh, going back and looking at the community. When you look at Fisk University in the 1960s, and especially in 1960 when the sit-ins began, uh, you kind of have to think about what's going on the decade before. John Kenneth Galbraith talk of, talks about the affluent society uh, that occurs after World War I. America is relatively wealthy, uh, but then again you have the other America that was also talked about. Uh, and the other America, I think at the time there were about 35 million people who were living below the poverty line. I think those students who, who came to Fisk, while they all may not have been, quote, middle class, they had middle class standards. Uh, they had middle class aspirations. They felt, as some of the uh, people in the movement told me, uh, we've done everything that you've asked us to do, society. Uh, we finished high school, we are now in college. Uh, they looked at the uh, occupations and jobs that their parents had. Uh, some were in the middle class, others were not. John Lewis would be a good example of that. Uh, but there was, first of all, when you look at Fisk, you have to look, Fisk has a long tradition of, of protest. You can go back to W.B. Du Bois. Uh, you can look at the student strike that took place in the 1920s that Du Bois was involved with. Uh, there was a young man in my class, and some of you may know him, Justin Jones, uh, who was there in the last couple of years, who came to Fisk specifically because of its reputation of trying to make society a better place. Um, and that was the first thing he told me. As a matter of fact, I don't know how he knew my name, uh, mm -hmm. But he was a freshman and he, he found me. He said, Professor Wynn, I'm taking all of your civil rights courses because that's the reason I came. Mm. Uh, I want to make society a better place and Fisk has that tradition. Uh, so when you look at Fisk and you look at the 1960s and you look at people like Diane Nash, Marion Berry, uh, and, and others who were there, 
you know, you, you, you think about Diane Ash. She comes here from Howard University, Washington, D.C. What causes her to become involved? She goes to the state fair. What does she see? These ubiquitous signs of for colored only or for white only. That gets beneath her skin. It, it, it moves her to want to act. And in some ways, you have to go back and look at Diane Ash's background. Her grandmother was somewhat of an activist. Uh, she instilled in Diane Ash at a very early age that you are just as good as anyone else including whites. So, you know, sometimes you have to get to each individual's personal experience even before they come to these campuses uh, to understand what is motivating them. Uh, the, the students there, when you, when you look at leadership, uh, Diane Nash ended up being over the Nashville student movement, but she was not the first person. Uh, there were two males, uh, but somehow or another they didn't pay particular attention to detail. Uh, and ultimately, those who were involved with the Nashville student movement elected Diane Nash to be the leader of the Nashville student movement because of her particular attention to details. Uh, when you look at Fisk University, and, and you try to figure out what make them take action. It's being, this is coming six years after Brown versus Board. Uh, so, you know, this idea of desegregating society uh, is permeating uh, within each one, I think. And they look at what is that most obvious space that we cannot be fully accorded. It's okay for me to go into the rest, into the store and purchase a good, but you don't want my money if I want to purchase a service. That is wrong. It, 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 it was morally wrong. And I think that's the piece that we often leave out with the students. They understood the morality of the situation or the lack of morality of the situation. Uh, and that is exemplified, I think, over and over uh, when you talk to those who were active in the movement, uh, when you listen to John Lewis talk, even when you hear him talk today. His underlying theme is a lack of morality, a lack of justice uh, across the board. So Fisk University and its students had a long relationship with active participation in an attempt to right wrongs. Uh, so that, I think that's part of the... Thank you, Linda. You, you mentioned long tradition, and, and Dr. Outlaw, I'm coming to you next. And I hope that you'll speak to being a student at Fisk University, but also think about that long tradition, being on an HBCU campus and moving to the coast and coming back here and, going, and being at Vanderbilt, the idea of what a history of commitment is or looks like on a campus, um, whether that be your history of commitment at Fisk or now what we are seeing on our college campuses today. Yeah, thank you, and thanks to all of the folk who at the Frist and Gail in her office for organizing and asking me to be a part of this to share with, with my distinguished colleagues here. So I came to uh, Nashville in 1963 as a freshman from Starkville, Mississippi. Uh, keep in mind that earlier that year in 63, I had lived through, as have many people in the country and in Mississippi in particular, had lived through the signature historical event of James Meredith entering the University of Mississippi with the support of the nationalized Mississippi National Guard. This has happened early, before I even get to Nashville. So the question about civil rights and justice and access to education, et cetera, is already hot, really hot. And in my hometown, Starkville, is Mississippi State University, which as they 
said later, a couple of years later, had never knowingly, and that's an interesting way they put it, had never knowingly admitted a Negro. Now they were saying that <laughs> in the summer of 1965 because the first Negro knowingly admitted was one of my best friends and classmates, Richard Holmes, who just decided to go one summer. I come to Nashville in 1963 as a freshman at Fisk University. My freshman year it begins right after the march on Washington where King delivers what is now regarded as the famous I Have a Dream speech. One of the people who delivers one of the major addresses is John Lewis. So I come onto the campus where the movement is already up and underway and where Fisk is already a significant site of participation leadership in that movement. And one of the things I think we must take note of in thinking about these institutions. TSU was a state supported, is a state supported institution, which means TSU is under the auspices of the legislature of Tennessee. Fisk University is a private institution. It was not under the auspices of either city or state government. That was explicit, explicit when you were a student on that campus during the period of the movement. Let me say this a different sort of way. You knew that as a student at Fisk, if you were participating in the movement, no state or city officials could touch you. The institution could not be leveraged by the city and by the state. They knew that. You were made aware of that. So Fisk was this interesting oasis within the city where folk could be participating in this movement. Secondly, Fisk was involved in exchange programs with several historically predominantly white residential liberal arts colleges throughout the country. So there were white students at Fisk already. Thirdly, a substantial portion of the faculty of Fisk was white, including professors who were Jewish, some of whom landed at Fisk after escaping the Holocaust in Europe. So Fisk is this really, really significant institutional oasis in this city that is incubating young people to be about certain kinds of things. Now what do I mean by that? That you are being told explicitly about expectations of what you are to do with your life how you are to comport yourself day in and day out. Part of it was, for example, if you are a female, it should be the case, if you're on the street downtown, that anyone should be able to look at you and say, oh, there goes a Fisk lady. How you dressed, how you walked, how you talked, how you comported yourself in public should exemplify your connection to the institution and that you were going to be carrying out something significant in the conduct of your life in the future of this country. So when I came on board and young folk are involved in this movement, right, I've got classmates heavily involved. My family, parents were some of those who Martin Luther King Jr. came to speak my freshman year. I go to the gym, I listen to Martin Luther King Jr., I come back to my dorm, I'm all excited. Within an hour, somebody's hollering down the hall, the, you know, the payphone on the wall is ringing, somebody answers the phone, and somebody says, hey, Lucius, your mother's on the phone. Well, you know, I've, I've been embarrassed by this since high school. You know, oh, Lord, my mother's on the phone. I go answer the phone, yeah, it's my mother. My mother and father have heard through WLAC or some radio station that King has spoken at Fisk. I'm literally just getting back to the door from the gym and they on the phone to me, don't you get involved with that stuff. <laughs> now, my parents are worried not just about me, but about themselves, about their work. My mother 
worked in the homes of white families. My father was janitor of First Baptist Church, which is a big white Baptist church. So they worried about retribution against them as well as about me. Now, I wasn't, you know, at that time radical enough to buck my parents, so I didn't. I stood one day as classmates and others from students lined up to leave the campus to go march downtown singing freedom songs. And I'm standing there with another woman uh, who was director of a dorm, Mrs. Cole, and I'm standing there crying because I can't go, and she and I cheer them on as they go. They go to march. They get arrested. They go with the understanding, if we get arrested, the dean and or the president or so-and-so is going to go raise money and get our bail, and we're going to be back out, and they're coming back out of jail, taking showers, singing freedom a song, and they're back out on the street the next day. This is what it meant to be at a private institution that was self-consciously providing a nurturing environment for young people to be involved in nonviolent civil rights structure. The institution admitted there were no students, to my knowledge, ever dismissed from Fisk for participating in that movement. Not a single one. Because there could be no leverage placed upon them. And later when we talk about later on during the Nashville so-called riots of 67, which was my senior year, another place where you could begin to see how as a private institution they could function and hold off the pressures of city administration and police because they were not beholden to city or state funds that were well-to-do white folk in this city who supported FISC were on this board. But a lot of the support for FISC was coming outside the state. So FISC was able to function with a degree of freedom that TSU did not have. And so the students could function with a kind of freedom and a belief that they were going to be supported by the administration of the university in a way that was not the same, say, for TSU. It was certainly happening for American Baptists. But this was a really interesting oasis with white faculty and staff visiting white students and this sense of, of course, go and do that. We've got your back. You're arrested, we'll have you out. And off they go again back up there in that street, et cetera, et cetera. Very important part of the story. And, and I think it's important for us to paint these pictures of what these institutions represented, and we're not forgetting American Baptists and the idea of the role of clergy or the role of, of being um, God giving you this purpose of social justice. And I remember probably maybe 15 years ago um, when we were launching, all of us, our oral history project, and uh, Reverend C.T. Vivian, and, and we, those of us who know Reverend Vivian, he said, well, Andrea, why are you doing an oral history project trying to interview students of the movement? I said, well, Reverend Vivian, I want to know what brought all of these, these people to Nashville at the same time. And he said, well, you can end your project. I can tell you now. God ordained all of us to be here. End of story. Your project is over, right? And so now we've got another oasis in what American Baptists meant, whether that's leadership by Bevel or Bernard or Dr. Lafayette, this idea of what American Baptists meant to the students as well. And also Meharry. We can look at people like Rodney Powell or Gloria Powell. So each of these institutions played a key role in sustaining what we now consider the most successful student-led modern civil rights movement that we know of of our time. Um, go ahead, we Dr. We should Allen. add one other institution to this list. Go ahead. Two, Scarrett Bennett. That's right. And Peabody College. Right. Peabody was not a part of Vanderbilt at that time. But Scarrett Bennett, and we must say particularly, something about the role of certain young white women who had the courage to get involved in this movement out of Scared Bennett in particular in Peabody. That's a big, big deal that needs to be talked about. You know, I think when you, when you talk about American Baptist College, which was then American Baptist Theological Seminary, you, you have to include uh, the Reverend Kelly Miller Smith because he was there. Uh, he was a part of the school desegregation effort. Uh, he is the one who encouraged other students there to become involved. 
Uh, you, you cannot underestimate the role that American Baptist College and its leaders and, and those who were in the professorial ranks played in this modern movement. Uh, Andrea, I remember when Reverend C.T. Vivian made that remark. Yes. Uh, because when I interviewed him, you know, because I was asking the same question. He was, how do you account for all of these people being in one place at one time? Uh, and he says, oh, Linda, because Reverend Vivian was a, used to be a member of my church. Mm -hmm. Linda, just, you don't need to ask that question. God ordained for all of us to be there, and that's the reason we were there. Mm -hmm. uh, you, enough said. Uh, but, you know, I, let's, we, we tend to forget about Reverend Kelly Miller Smith. Mm -hmm. And I think, especially as it relates to American Baptist College, and I think he played a very pivotal role. Mm -hmm. um, after all, it was he who established the Nashville Christian Leadership Conference. He served on the board of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Uh, so he, he plays a very pivotal role in this movement. And, you know, I'd like to say, I look at the movement as a part of a freedom struggle. And I don't think that that struggle is over. Uh, I think we, we advance along various stages of that struggle. Uh, the one thing that I, I noted about Mr. Jones uh, was that, you know, he thought that those students of the 60s uh, didn't have to contend with the adults. And I would say, Mr. Jones, yes, they did. Uh, each generation contends with adults. Uh, and just like your generation, that generation, while they respected and honored the adults, uh, Lucius, you was, you, know, you was talking about 63, but I want to talk about 1960, uh, when, when the students decided from all of the universities and colleges to actually conduct the, that first full sit-in because Nashville, while the press gave North Carolina A&T all of the credit, test sit-ins were conducted here in Nashville in December, November and December of 1959. And their whole purpose was to affirm and confirm that yes, I as an African American, I as a Negro, or I as a black cannot actually partake of the services provided. Uh, and they found out the answer to that question, but it was a matter of proving the question. So while it started earlier here in Nashville, North Carolina, A&T, of course, garnered the uh, attention of the media. Uh, but when you, when you look at, you know, the students decided on February the 13th, which is you was talking about how at Fisk, you know, they knew that they were going to be taken care of. And that was the reason, you know, the ministers and all of the leaders wanted to wait because they wanted to have money for bail, medical services, legal services, all of these things in place. The students went against the adult leadership. And they said, we're going now. And on February the 13th, they started. So there was that friction between adult leaders and youth leaders just like it is today when you look at the Black Lives Matter movement or other move, social movements that are, oh, absolutely. It, it was the same. They like, were very supportive at first then. No, they weren't very, well, you know, I'm not so sure the African American community in general was very supportive of the Black Power movement. It, 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 <laughs> it, it took a while for, for them to get there. Uh, but again, when you look at you know, that freedom struggle, it is a, a step along the path. Um, and I don't think we have completely uh, made it to where we are really trying to go uh, mm -hmm. at this point. But you cannot leave out the importance of American Baptist College and Kelly Miller Smith and those ministers who were there. But there's a, there is a link, as I'm going to say. You know, I, yeah, I live with, you know, I'm an old son of man with one foot in hell and the other on a banana peel, you know? <laughs> so I figure, right now, I really am being punished for some of my sins, because I'm in a position where talking about the civil rights movement, 
I'm working at Vanderbilt and I got to speak in behalf of Vanderbilt. That has to be punishment for my sins. <laughs> <laughs> but when we talk about American Baptists and Kelly Miller, there is an institutional linkage there with Vanderbilt. So one of the things you know, I often have to say to people is we use the phrase Vanderbilt University as though it is a singular something. That term actually covers 10 units. There's 10 schools and colleges that make up what is known as Vanderbilt University. One of those units is the Divinity School. Now, the Divinity School was the first unit to admit Negroes, when no other units were doing it. The first was Bishop Joseph Johnson. The second was James Morris Lawson, Jr. So Reverend Lawson was at the Divinity School. And when he was expelled, a sizable portion of that faculty resigned in protest. Lamar Alexander was president of the student governments when the students in the 60s voted whether or not they should support the desegregation of Vanderbilt University. They said no. And Lamar Alexander wasn't protesting either. So I'm just saying, that's the College of Arts and Science. The Divinity School had already admitted two persons of color and Reverend Lawson. And when he was expelled, many of them resigned in protest. So there's this other island within Vanderbilt, the Divinity School, which has been shaped by a mission committed to prophetic theology where you had committed people. You will see one of the places in here of faculty, white faculty, male and female and students, protesting on the campus the expulsion of Reverend Lawson. So there's that unit. Kelly Miller is going to become part of that unit. Forrest Harris is going to become part of that unit. So the Divinity School is worth noting as one of the units within Vanderbilt University during this time, a really important part of it. And so, so those are your sins that you were paying for. That's what you said, right? Okay. So I want to I wanna push you a little bit, each of you, in that idea of student activism and what it meant to your institutions for the college experience in 1950 and 1960 and the 70s. And this resurgence of, you know, Linda said that the movement, it's a, it's a continuum, right? It never ends. It, it, we, we know that. Until we become this totally perfect anti-racist society, the movement never ends. It never will end until we get there. But talk to us about what's going on on campuses right now. Um, the history and the, the notable people that came out of the institutions that each of you represent, what are we doing? What are you doing? What are the students doing right now? Lou just said that the faculty resign. Do we see faculty resigning after the hashtag Me Too movement? I'm, I'm just asking. I told you it was going to get really good at the I end. Can, I right? can. To, Lee, talk to us what's going on TSU's campus and if the commitment to serve and to be a voice is still there on these campuses. Give each of you talk a little bit, a little bit about what we see now before we open it up to our guests. Um. I think leadership has taken a new form, and, and I listen very intently to what, um, what my two colleagues said. And one thing that struck me was the comment about ministers. Um, the black church, for most of African American history, has been a crucible for black leadership, whether it's on the plantation where oftentimes the most powerful man would be the black minister. Why? Because he's getting his authority from up on high. It goes from the minister, from God to the minister to you. The obligations, the social obligations that the church has had during Jim Crow to do for the people what society was unwilling to do. So it's only natural that when we see a movement for change occurred here in Nashville that the ministers are leading the way. But I would humbly submit to you that um, there are way more black ministers 
in these small little churches, then we're rolled at Vanderbilt or at American Baptist. So we started, I think our, our focus when we talk about leadership during this period, um, we need to explore the folks out there in the margins a little bit more, I think. Yeah, let, let, let me push back on that a little bit. You know, it was interesting, I had a conversation with Reverend Lawson once he was back for four years as a distinguished university professor. So let me offer the following to you. Uh, probably no more than 10 to 15 percent of black ministers were supportive of the movement. Let me say that again. No more than about 10 to 15 percent of black ministers were supportive of the movement. I mean, I like to say now, you can go throughout the South and find in black churches and homes all over the place pictures of Martin Luther King Jr., Paul also including Robert Kennedy and John F. Kennedy. They are celebrated in death in ways they were never honored in life. There wasn't a single black church in my hometown in Starville that was prepared to welcome Martin Luther King Jr. to town. Including the one where I, was, you know, I have seen the insides of more black Baptist churches than I ever need to see in the rest of my life. <laughs> None of the ones in my hometown were prepared to welcome Martin Luther King Jr. to town. Or were actively supportive of that movement. After he's dead, they all sing his praises. When he was alive, most of them didn't want anything to do with Martin Luther King Jr. They were afraid, didn't want him coming near their churches. And don't get me going on about the deacons in these churches. <laughs> and please don't get Sister Weir talking about the deacons and the women in that church, right? I mean, we like to say this stuff about the black church. I want to say, no, 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 whoa. Which churches are you talking about? Because in general, the black church, paternalistic is all get out. Misogynistic is all get out, arrogant, lying, thieving. Is, is, that, just the, is that just the black church or? I, I, no, no. We were just talking, no, oh. we were talking about black church. Okay, okay, all right, all right. that's, I got it. Don't, I don't even want to go start talking about the evangelical. I don't know what's going on with <laughs> evangelicals. Okay, okay. Don't I, don't go. So I ain't going to even go there. I, I don't know, right. we went from sin activism no, to the church, but you cannot disconnect the two. But, but, but let, me, let me add to what you're saying because he's, he's absolutely correct. The civil rights movement caused a split in the Baptist denomination oh, and the me. convention. I got to leave. You're going to talk about them Baptists. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'll, stay. I'll stay. I'll stay. I'm a Baptist, we, and I can say it. Okay, you and me both. Okay. Uh, it, it, it caused a big split, so he's absolutely correct. It was not until after the assassination of Martin Luther King that many began to, and that's inclusive of all, that many began to embrace King. And when they embrace King, they do not think about the radical King. They only look at the I have a dream king. That's right. They do not look at all aspects of Martin Luther King. And when you really read about and study Martin Luther King, he was as radical right. as, as, as Malcolm X, only right. in a different way. Right. Which, which scares me because when I look at the old banner clippings and I see these images of, of how near Fisk campus or the riots, and we're talking about a little bit later, mm -hmm. and how our city responded to Stokely Carmichael coming to Nashville, or how we have a shift in leadership from John Lewis to Stokely and SNCC, but we didn't feel that way about Dr. King, right? We've etched his name in glass everywhere, but we have completely removed Stokely. We've completely removed any thought of putting King in this idea of a radical. And I know we've gotten off topic, and I'm sorry for all and, those. And let me Go address ahead, your point about the students. Um, I received a curious email one night, and don't ask me while I'm up at night looking at my emails, right? Um, the student says, Dr. Williams, take a look at the news tonight. So I turned to the news, and I saw where um, the students were sitting out in the middle of the freeway. And I thought about how insane that was. Um, but then I remember that photograph I saw from the banner where the students are sitting in the middle of Broadway at lunch in 
an environment, I don't want to say it was more hateful or more spiteful, but the chances are back in that period they could do something and get away with it. Um, but I guess the, the point that I'm trying to make, um, that there had to be some level of audacity in the mind of our people, of our, our students at the time. And that might be a young folk characteristic, I guess. Um, you know how when you're younger, you tend to be more impulsive. Okay, we need to do something. We need to do it right now. But as your hair starts graying a little bit, you say, all right, we need to think this thing through. So oftentimes we, we beat up on our young folks. We say that, hey, they are not involved. They are not thinking clearly. They're not looking at life properly. But um, in retrospect, I think that we do have a lot more in common with them than we would like to admit. Um, another quick point, and I'll pass the mic. Um, now civil rights activists from TSU that were active during the 60s, they still got a certain fire about them. <laughs> and I don't want them to say that they're quick to anger, um, but when it's time to move, they are ready to move. Um, as a professor, every now and then I would go to the barbershop and I would talk um, to some gents that were at TSU during the 60s, and they'd ask me how things were going on campus. And if, for those of y'all that are in academia, you know that things are never perfect on campus, right? <laughs> so I would share a, a gripe that I have, and they, they'd say, Doc, you need us to go talk to the president for you? <laughs> and I'm like, no, I got this. I got this with things. <laughs> um, but the, the, the point that I'm trying to make is that um, it, it takes a certain level of fire to even get involved in a movement like this. Now we're mindful that you needed some cooler heads to prevail because you always need a plan. You just can't rush out and do things. But the, um, I don't see a great deal of difference between the students that I've encountered in the Black Lives Matter movement or the Me Too movement than um, what I've heard from some activists of the 60s. The comment that I wanted to make, uh, which is very analogous to the churches, we tend to think that all black people were involved, excluding the churches, in the movement, mm -hmm. and they weren't. Okay, it was, a, it was a relatively small percentage of individuals who were involved. Uh, Lucius, uh, even on the campus of, of Fisk University, around the time that you were there, two very prominent people uh, that I interviewed, I won't call names, uh, but they didn't even know what was going on and they were there at the time. Uh, you know, they, they were off doing something else. And again, when you look at the student populations at these institutions and those who were actually involved, it's a very small percentage. And that is the way it is in most movements. It's not everybody out there participating for whatever reason. I mean, I believe in the cause. My parents may not want me to be involved. Uh, I remember my cousin telling me a story and they were at Pearl High School when they marched downtown on April the 19th. Her brother came and said, come on, I'm going, to, I'm joining the march. And her first response was, now you know, and she called her mother by her first name, wouldn't want us down there. I'm going, you can come and go with me or you can stay here. And her response was, well, I guess I better go in case something happens to you, I'll know what happened, okay? <laughs> So she joined the march, and uh, many people leave out the high school students. But remember, high school students participated too. Now, it may have been a little bit later, but on that April the 19th, students came out of Pearl High School, and they joined the march, that silent march that was conceived by the Reverend C.T. Vivian, who had participated in a silent march 
in the 1940s in Chicago. That was his idea. And you still hear people talk about just hearing feet walking down the street of three to 4,000 souls, an inclusive march. So let's not leave out those students, but everybody was not involved. It's a small percentage in any movement of all the people. Yeah, and one of the things I want to encourage all of you, you know, you're, you're, you've already demonstrated your interest and concern by being here. I want to encourage every one of you, either individually or as couples or as groups or whatever, get a copy of this, if you haven't gotten one already, and make it a focus of study. I mean, not just to put on your coffee table for somebody to see when they come in or for you to demonstrate, I'm cool, see it's on my coffee table. <laughs> But take it to one of your church groups, or your synagogue groups, your temple groups, or your women's reading group, or to the beauty parlor, wherever, and discuss it with some people, and look through, and start asking questions about the pictures. What's happening in these pictures? What are these folks thinking about? What would I have been thinking about? What would I have done? With whom do I identify in these pictures? Uh, let's just say, we talk about this movement about black folk. Everything going on with that movement that was positive was not done just by black folk. White folk were involved too. So I think it's important to talk about Scared Bennett, Peabody, young white women getting involved, faculty from these things, people at Fisk like Nelson and Marion Fuson, I mean, people you need to know about because here was a white faculty member, a Quaker, living on the campus, raising their two sons, two white people living on this Negro, become black later on campus, raising white sons who must go to school and deal with all the turmoil that is being directed at them and their family for their solidarity with this movement of black people. That was extraordinarily painful for that family and for those young men. Many of us are old enough to know what it means if you're white and you take a stand in behalf of this, how quickly you will be called a nigger lover. This happened to those people, to those young men. Get this and study it. And by the way, while I'm saying I just got to say, um, you were talking about high school students being involved, you know, and, and one of these plates in here, under the Watch for Our Metro National Police, a group of high school age students. I'm looking at this picture, I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. So I took a picture of this picture with my phone, sent it to a classmate in DC, and said, Who's that fourth woman from the left? Isn't that you? <laughs> and she's like, oh God, yes that is. <laughs> and behind me is Diane Kitty, and I'm looking at them like, those aren't high school students. They're students from Fisk. This is my freshman year. There's a bunch of these women who are, that's okay, I've got some more too, I won't disclose them here. So, <laughs> I got to go beat up on the press about copy editing, but that's another story too. As you can see, we've tried to encapsulate over um, not even just 50 years of history. Linda took us back to 1860. You know, a couple of hundred years of history within one hour, that's hard to do, right? And people's life work, whether it's dissertation or research, in, in one hour. We can't do it. And Dr. Outlaw gave us a charge to dig deep to look to our institutions, look at how photos were taken during the 50s and 60s and identify with them. What are young people doing today? We have multiple topics that we will leave each of you with, but we do have like one minute or two to open up the floor if you have questions for our panelists, because each of them have given us a charge, a charge that each of us have work to do. And the idea that we can no longer just say young people aren't doing anything, because if Linda said young people, are, what they're doing today is the same thing they were doing in 1960, and none of us beat up on John Lewis and Diane Nash, then we shouldn't beat up on young people today for their rights of saying that this is my voice as well. So we have a few minutes for a couple of questions, if there's one or two, or none. 
because we can continue to talk, but we know we want to at least be mindful. Yes. I'm sorry. Could you give me your opinions on the NFL kneeling for the national anthem? I am sure on both sides we have military that have spilled blood for our country, and I'd just like to know uh, your thoughts on that. Yeah, one of the things I've always I find particularly disturbing is the question of the national anthem getting linked to the question of the military. I don't understand, I mean, I understand what that is about politically, mm -hmm. right? How many of us sing the national anthem but were not in the military? Raise your hand. <laughs> there you go. I mean, why is it that we want to link this to the military, that only if you are singing the national anthem are you showing allegiance to the military? What is that linkage about? Most of us who sing the national anthem have never been in the military. So it isn't that that's showing you, patriotism is not only about being in the military, you could be a patron and be opposed to military adventures, right? This is about free speech. Look, for my generation, we wouldn't stand for the national anthem when I was a teenager because we thought it was racist given all that was going on. So you remember when they used to play the national anthem at the beginning of the movie theater? Not just football game, in the movie theater. And we would sit down and say, we ain't standing for that racist national anthem and we'd sit there. This is not new. What about Especially if you freedom look at that of third verse. That's right. Freedom of speech. We are guaranteed the right to protest. And if the citizens believe that the government are not, is not serving it, they have the right to seek to change that government. That's guaranteed to us. So what is this making protests about the national anthem be against the military? No, it isn't. It is not about being opposed to the military. Let's not pimp the military for cheap political purposes. If, if we don't have another question, I think both of them want to respond briefly, um, but I think we have one more question. Is, do we have time for one more question? Okay, I think the young lady with the red shirt on. Good afternoon, thank you for accepting my question. Uh, when we speak about the freedom to march, and we speak about how the children today, uh, we want them to be bold and to march for their right. Uh, you know, we did experience that, that freedom to, to walk out, but we did and we did not. So, my question to you is, I guess about the, the parents, no, the adults now, who knows about the march and know what the march means, but still want to control the march of our generation today. So what am I saying? There was a, a, a protest and there was not a protest because there was a school, or maybe a couple of schools, that gave the kids, children the right to march only if they tell them the day before they want to march. So, Y'all address that because I can get very sentimental with that. Linda, you want to reflect on the idea of adult led adults still having their hands and, and, and kind of controlling, that's what your question was? The idea of adults still leading a student-led movement? Okay. If I were to tell you that today I'm going to march tomorrow, Okay. Right. no, it's not like going to the court to make the court and getting a petition. It's about everyone ought to know all over Nashville that it's time to march. Okay. And the children was wanting to but you know how they are now, they didn't really have the just of okay. what we, they wanted, the freedom to, but they were like, no, you didn't tell me yesterday. 
Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll let one of these two in our wrap up that final the idea of an adult-led hand over a student-led movement. Okay, Linda or Lee, or both. You, again, I'm gonna go back to the fact that then, back in the 60s, the students did pretty much what they wanted to do. I, but there's a caveat. When you look at that movement, those students studied direct, nonviolent protest. They were schooled in what to do and what not to do in order to protect themselves. Discipline? Yeah, discipline. It, it, it calls for discipline. You can't just go out there and protest without having a certain amount of discipline. J just think how, how did those students manage to sit on a stool and have somebody spit on them? How did they manage to sit on a stool and have somebody knock them off? How did they manage to sit on a stool and have somebody put cigarette butts out on them? How did they manage to get on that bus and ride to Alabama knowing that their lives were, go were going to be in danger because they had already been warned, don't, don't come here. CORE aborted that freedom ride. It takes discipline. It takes, it takes mental discipline. And in order to be mentally disciplined, you have to study. It takes emotional discipline because the reaction of most of us would be if somebody hits me, I'm going to hit you back. That's, that's just human nature. How do you do that? Discipline. And students need to be taught disciplines. That was one of my concerns when Gina Six was going on. And, and all of the students were getting on buses, going to protest. And I wondered, how disciplined will they be? Do you really know how to participate in a direct, nonviolent protest? I hear what you're saying, but, but my concern is that we are not studying the methodology and the strategy for nonviolent protests, and that's something we often leave out. Those students studied it, whether they were at Tennessee State, Fisk, Meharry, ABC, Vanderbilt, Scarrett, Peabody. They all had that. It takes a certain type of person to be able to do that. Everybody can't do it. I tell my students when I teach civil rights, I, can't, I couldn't do that. <laughs> Okay, I mean, I know my temperament. I couldn't do that. I could participate in another way. I could be in the background, maybe taking students downtown. If one wave left and another one had to come, I could make signs. There are other things that I could do, but I could not be on the front line because I just don't think my temperament would allow me to let somebody just Put your Hit me. <laughs> Before I thank our guest, Lee, I know you wanted to respond real quick, and then I'll, um, I'll wrap it up and thank everybody. I, um, as, as I, I listened to your question, I thought about some of the stuff that I was involved in in Tallahassee, Florida, and um, I really didn't give it much thought. I was upset about something that the state of Florida was doing, and somebody said, hey, Lee, we, we're going to go sit in front of the governor's office. So I said, cool, I'm, I'm with you. <laughs> um, but even when you think about Nashville during the time the riots occurred, oftentimes um, our anger is, is a, a visceral response to a bad situation. Um, but anger is a very human response, I think. Um, but having said that, we, as, as a young person, 
um, I oftentimes thought that my father and my mother, they didn't really know what they were talking about. They didn't know the world had just passed them on. And so when they told me some things and I did not listen, what happened? I ended up making the same mistakes that they did. So I said all that to say this. Um, it, it takes both, I think. I have a lot of good ideas, I think, but I don't really have the energy to put them into play. But my, my, my students do, so that's, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very much encouraged by what I hear and what I see out of my classrooms at Tennessee State University. I can't speak to Fisk or Vanderbilt or Meharry, but I, I, I like what I see at TSU. I think that's a great place to end, a place of hope, right? And the idea of 50 plus years of history, we should remain hopeful and hope that this next generation will take on the lessons that each of us have learned from a movement that changed not only Nashville, the South, but the, the, it changed the temperament of our country and hopeful that what inspired a generation in 1950 and 1960 continues to inspire each of us. So if you would please join me in thanking our panelists, Dr. Lucius Outlaw, <laughs> Professor Linda Wynn, Dr. Lee Williams, and our host and our guest, Frisk Center and Vanderbilt University. Thank you.